Good morning, and thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning, November the 15th. I hope that you have had a great week. I want to share a few announcements with you. Of course, this is our Sunday morning Bible study, and this week we're being led by Julia Killian. Uh, her lessons, lesson is entitled, God Justifies, and it's taken from Isaiah chapter 53. Hope that you'll uh, enjoy and get something out of her lesson that she has prepared for us. Of course, at 11 o'clock, um, Pastor Sean will be beginning a series entitled Glimpses of the Holy One from the book of Isaiah. So you'll want to join us at 11 o'clock for that. Also, uh, this coming Wednesday evening, November the 18th at 6.30, is our budget discussion for our 2021 budget. And that will be at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Please call the church office starting Monday to reserve your seat for our budget discussion on Wednesday evening. And the following Wednesday, November the 25th at 7 o'clock, is our Thanksgiving service that will be held uh, in the sanctuary. And the Monday before that, you're welcome to call in and make reservations for our Thanksgiving service. Hope that you'll be a part of these ministries at Monument Heights Baptist Church. And now, a uh, prayer request. Crystal Boshan is in Chippingham Hospital. She had surgery earlier this week, and we need to remember her as she recovers from that. We also need to remember Bill Childress, who had surgery earlier this week, and Joan Davis. And we express sympathy to Graham Bowman on the passing of his wife, Carol Bowman, on November the 5th, and also sympathy to Mark Bearden on the passing of his stepfather, Foster Castleman, on November the 9th of 2020. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for uh, this time in the life of Monument Heights Baptist Church with Sean's coming and things that we are trying to do, even in the middle of a pandemic, to continue to reach out and be a beacon for you on the corner of Monument and Libby and beyond. I would lift up the ministries that are ongoing, uh, the feedings that we do uh, for our church members in Greater Mount Moriah, and taking it to the streets, as well as other things that are going on, like the Bible study that we're able to have this morning, uh, even though it's not in person. Lord, I would ask that you would be with Bill Childress and Crystal Boshan and Graham Bowman and Mark Bearden at this time. We lift them up. You know their needs, and we ask that you respond as only you can. For we do pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Welcome. Glad that you have joined us for our Bible study today. We will be looking at Isaiah 53. The title of the lesson, and the lesson comes from Explore the Bible, is entitled God Justifies. We will be considering all of Isaiah 53, which only consists of 12 verses, but we cannot, in the short time that we have, really look at them exhaustively. I really consider the lesson today more of an outline for you, anybody who is participating here today, so that you can go back during the week and read the verses and study the verses on your own with some background. You will have some background from today, and it really will prepare you to have a more in-depth study of Isaiah 53. The main theme of Isaiah 53 is what God and the servant did or have done for humankind. And so the lesson 
is about the one true God, about his forgiving our sins, and how he justifies believers by taking their sin on himself through the person of Jesus. Isaiah 53 is an important book in the Bible, and it's referred to 42 times in the New Testament. So having an understanding of this chapter will be really important, you know, even in reading the New Testament. Also, I want you to know it's a poem. Isaiah 53 is part of the poem. The actual poem begins in the last three verses of chapter 52. So chapter 52, the last three verses, and all 12 verses in chapter 53 uh, constitute the poem. So it's a 15-line poem, and we have 12 lines of that poem we're going to talk about today. There's some things that are confusing about these verses, and I want to mention them and encourage everyone not to be stumped or to give up because you don't know the answer to everything. So the first thing I want to say is that the speakers in the poem change. There are two or three speakers in these 12 lines, and the change is not delineated nor necessarily identified. So if you're not aware that the speakers change, that could cause some confusion. The speakers are man or the conscience of mankind. That's one. God is another speaker. And the third speaker possibly is the prophet who is speaking. So there are possibly three voices in these 12 lines. And the other thing is the use of pronouns. He and him are used. And especially in verse 2, uh, people are not certain um, to whom is being referred. So, again, it's a small thing. And I believe that the first he, we'll talk about it in a minute, I believe that is the servant, which, of course, we would know today as Jesus. And the second him, I think, is God, although other people have identified that him as a different person. And the third thing that I think sometimes causes difficulty is the tense. The first stanza is written in present or present perfect tense, and the rest of the poem is basically written in past tense, which may seem strange because it's a prophecy of what will happen. Isaiah was written approximately 700 years uh, or a, uh, it was written many years before Jesus was born, and therefore it should be written in pres present, I mean future tense, since it's talking about a future event that will happen. Jesus has not lived as a human being yet, but he will live as a human being. But it's written in past tense. So those are the things that we need to keep in mind, and not to worry about those things, but just to read this poem for the meaning, whatever meaning we can get from it. And it's full of meaning. That's why I suggest that you study this poem all week or maybe even longer as you look at chapter uh, 53. Okay, let's come. I wanted to start, however, with um, Isaiah 59.2. It's, it's not part of our scriptures for today, but it's it just sets the stage for where we are, even in life today. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. This is a situation that humankind finds itself in. If we have not accepted Christ as our Savior, then we have not been restored to God or our relationship has not been restored to him. It's as if I'm here and God is here and there's a wall between us and the wall like just dropped down because of my sins so I'm separated from God. This, the uh, chapter that we're studying today, Isaiah 53, um, shows us how God raises that wall, how he justifies believers by taking the sin on himself and therefore we are no longer separated from God by the sin which we could not get beyond at one time in our lives. So let's go ahead and start reading and let's start with the question that's posed in verse 1. Isaiah 53, 1. 
Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is just a question to ponder. How many people, uh, I'm talking about today now, not back when this was written, but how many, and it's a prophecy, how many people through the years of existence, from the time of prophecies up through the life of Christ up to our present time, how many people have heard the message and how many people have seen the action or the doings of the arm of God, who have seen evidence that God does exist? And that's the question. Who has believed? Based on what we have heard and what we have seen through all these years of history, who has believed and who has seen? The answer is, a lot of people have rejected Jesus, and therefore they have rejected God. The pro one of the problems is that we are used in this day and age, especially with television and news media and movies and things like that, sometimes to accept what we see or what we hear on a first impression. And Jesus is the one we're going to read now about his, the servant's life repudiates that. We have to look at something deeper, not just the surface. We are to look beyond what our first impression is. Um, and we will see that. So let's look at verses 2 and 3 now. We could divide the, this poem into stanzas, if we could say, of three lines or three verses each. So the first line in the second stanza was verse 1, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of God been revealed? Now we'll look at verses 2 and 3. He grew up, talking about the servant, He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one whom from people hide their face. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. So these do not look too positive. These lines and these verses don't. We see here, though, that God, Jesus, or the servant, came from an humble beginning. He was a tender shoot, and it was as, as if he came out of dry ground, which you would not expect a shoot to sprout forth from uh, a, a dry or barren ground. And that may point to Jesus' humble beginning, his poor family, uh, perhaps a frail appearance, but certainly not an appearance like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Dion Saunders, not this big hulking man that just calls attention to himself, perhaps by his size and his appearance. In, this, in verse 2, we see that he had no beauty and majesty to attract us to him. That does not mean that he was ugly or anything like that, but it means that if you just looked at him, you would not be drawn to him. And then the third thing, or the, in the third verse, we see that he was despised and rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering, and he was familiar with pain. What we are seeing here is how people accepted him, or how they would accept him. It's written in past tense, but it's still talking about the future. We're going to discuss it in past tense, so as if it's already happened. And we know that Jesus has already lived and died and been raised from the dead, so we can talk about that. Um, maybe as Christians, we don't think of Jesus as being despised, or maybe being rejected because certainly we accept him and we are grateful for what he did for us but even think back to his disciples the night of Jesus's arrest his disciples rejected him I won't say they despised him but they abandoned him and then Peter who remained behind if you remember he actually denied Jesus three times that night just as Jesus predicted he would and so throughout Jesus' life, frequently he was despised and rejected, especially by the political and religious leaders of his day, but also at a very important time in his life and ministry, he was rejected in a way by his disciples and even by Peter. Let's look at verses 4, 5, and 6 now. In these verses, oh, I, I forgot to say this, but the first line of each little section um, gives us the main theme of that section or the main idea that will be discussed in that section. In verses 1, 2, and 3, the first sentence says, Who has believed? And so stanzas 1, 2, and 3 address that issue, Who has believed? 
And what we find here is that many people have not believed he, because Jesus was despised and rejected. Now we go to the second group of verses for today. And this begins with, Surely he, meaning the servant, took our pain and bore our suffering. So these three verses are going to talk about the pain and suffering of Jesus and the fact that he took them voluntarily. The funny thing is that during Jesus' day, people believed that if they became sick or ill or had some misfortune that they were being punished by God. And many people looked at Jesus as being punished. The, pun the, the suffering that he suffered was because of his actions, what he had done, sins that he had committed. Many of the religious people believed that he blasphemed God in his ministry and so they thought that the punishment was a just punishment for him or else they didn't care some of them did not care and so in verse 5 we talk we see the pain and suffering that he had for us he was pierced for our sins not for his sins and he was crushed by our iniquities by our sin and disobedience not by his sin and disobedience because he did not sin and he was not disobedient Yet the punishment that he suffered for us has a, a good effect on us. It has brought us peace with God. And by the wounds that Jesus suffered or that were inflicted upon him, by those wounds, we were healed. So Jesus was wounded, he suffered, he was executed on the cross, and he died. And yet that healed us. When we get to verse 6, this is a really famous or well-known verse in the Bible. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him, the servant, the iniquity of us all. Um, I'm not a farm girl, and I don't know much about sheep, but I know they wander, and they just wander off somewhere, and the shepherd has to go and find them and bring them back. And also, they're helpless. They can't defend themselves. And the shepherd protects them. And so like sheep, we need protection, we need guidance, we need somebody to bring us back. And the person or that does that or that did that for us was Jesus. And Jesus was the perfect shepherd because he was the perfect sacrifice. I wanted to talk just a second about the difference between righteous or righteousness and good and goodness. Being good means that we do helpful things, we do positive things, we make contributions that benefit people. That's what good means. Righteous means we're free from guilt. They don't mean the same thing. We can appear good in someone's eyes, but we may not appear righteous in their eyes, especially in the eyes of God. So the only way we can be righteous, how can we be free of guilt? The only way we can be free of guilt is if God forgives us. And in the Old Testament days, they would have sacrifices of sheep and goats and bulls and pigeons and doves and many things that offered temporary forgiveness. And then more would be uh, sacrificed. Many times, probably during a year, thousands of animals were sacrificed because the sacrifices were only temporary. But when Jesus became the sacrifice, he was not imperfect. He was not temporal, meaning he didn't just live for a while and die the way a sheep does, perhaps. But he's eternal. And so the sacrifice that he made was an eternal sacrifice. It was a perfect sacrifice. And anyone who accepts Jesus, even though we are not righteous, we are made made righteous. We are healed by what Jesus did for us, at least healed and made righteous in the eyes of God. And that is what we're talking about here in this lesson. That's how Jesus justifies us. He makes justifies means to make righteous. He makes us righteous through Jesus' sacrifice. Okay, let's look at verses now. The next stanza seven, eight, and nine. And if we're looking at the first line to set up what the, those whole three stanzas are about, that would be line 7, or verse, the first line in line 7, uh, verse 7. Okay, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. And this expresses the idea that Jesus was oppressed, but that he was humble. 
He didn't complain. He didn't call all the attention upon himself and say things were unfair and so forth. He had established his desire to do God's will, and he did it with humility. So if we look at the next line here, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Jesus went to his death silent and obedient, like a sheep goes to be sheared. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. This means through tyranny and the use of the current law at the time when he lived, he was arrested. Yet who of his generation protested? Now we know that some people did protest, but a lot. some of this poem, like this part, is a hyperbole, and it's indicating that maybe nobody did. We know some people did, but the people who did protest were not enough to change the verdict or change the outcome of what happened. For he was cut off from the land of the living, and this means that he was killed or he was executed, and it was an unjust execution, yet he remained silent. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people he was punished. So once again we see that his punishment had nothing to do with him but it was put upon him. Our, our sins were taken upon him. In verse 9 we find he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. If you think about it Jesus died on the cross as a criminal. He would have been taken down. His grave would have been with the wicked. He would have just the same. His body would have been disposed of as all other criminals, but it didn't, because if you remember, Joseph of Arimathea offered his tomb, and he and Nicodemus uh, came and and buried Jesus. So Jesus did end up with the rich in death, although his grave was intended to be with the wicked, though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Jesus was truthful, he was nonviolent, and he was innocent. He was a man of humility and forgiveness and love, and he was cruelly executed without protesting. Yet he was saved from the ignominy of a grave with the wicked by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Now let's look at the last three stanzas. The last three stanzas present the Lord's will. All three will be talking about God's will. Um, and we look at the first line there. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. One of the things if you are able to go through and um, study these verses some more is you can consider the purpose and the outcome of suffering in life, especially suffering uh, for God or suffering in God's will or for God's will and what that does for an individual and what it does even for, for society. But in this line we see that God's will was to crush Jesus and it was to cause him to suffer but it was in order to take our suffering away from us. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin God made Jesus' life an offering or a payment, the payment that was demanded for sin because sin does not go unpunished. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. The outcome for Jesus was not his death on the cross and his burial. That was not the end because this part is written in future tense, although most of it's been written in past tense. He will see his offspring. Who are Jesus' offspring? Well, you and I and everyone who has accepted Jesus as their Savior are his offspring. And he will see us and we will see him and be with him. So this is the continuation of this ministry that he came to earth to proclaim, even though his death was part of it. It didn't end with that. And he will prolong his own days. We know that Jesus was not buried and stayed buried, we know that he was resurrected and that he is in heaven with God. And the will of God will prosper in his hand. Jesus will be victorious. 
He is victorious, and he will be victorious. Let's look at verse 11. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And of course, seeing the light of life is seeing God and referring to the resurrection. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. It's not as if Jesus, in his lifetime, died for one person, and he saved one person. Many people do that. Or if you think about the firefighters on 9-11 and the policemen who rushed into the building and helped save thousands of people, yet that was a, a temporal thing. It happened and it was over. The gift that Jesus gives is not just given to one person and it's over or given to people who lived between this year and this year and it's over or given to people just who have accepted him now. His gift is a gift that's open for everyone and it's open today and it will be open tomorrow and it will be open the next day. As long as life continues on earth, Jesus' gift goes on giving to anyone who will accept it. So Christ already has justified many, many people, thousands, maybe millions of people, I don't know how many in the history of the world, and he, he has taken all their sin upon him. Verse 12, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, God is speaking here, and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. In this stanza, Jesus, or the servant, is being compared to a victorious king. And to the king, in the, these days that we're talking about, these old days, the spoils went, and the king could divide the spoils with, you know, with his various leaders and the people he wanted to. Well, God is going to divide the spoils with the strong, the people who are committed to, to Jesus. And the biggest portion, of course, goes to, G, to Jesus. He poured out his life unto death. He died. People considered him a sinner, and he actually took sin upon himself. Even though he didn't sin, he, he had sin upon him. He experienced what it was like to sin and to suffer the consequences of sin, and he did this for many people. And through his life and his death and his resurrection, he intercedes for many transgressors. Jesus is portrayed as a victorious prince, perhaps, or king, He's victorious over evil and over death and over the believer's separation from God. For certain, through his death and our acceptance of Jesus, we are reunited with God and our relationship is restored to God. I just want to review some really important points about what we've talked about today. Sin is punished. God punishes sin. However, Jesus will suffer our punishment for those who believe in him, or he's already suffered the punishment for those who believe in him. And the sin we're talking about here is being separated from God. So that doesn't mean that we will never sin again because God has, has suffered for our sin and reunited to God. It means God will forgive us when we sin because we're still not righteous. We're only righteous in God's eyes through Jesus' death. And so even though we pray that we won't sin and we try hard not to sin, sometimes we do. I don't think we live a life of sin, but we do sin. But, but, but we are restored to God through Jesus. The results of Jesus' sacrifice, for him the results were a long life. Jesus is eternal, of course. He will see and be with his offspring, and that would be believers. He fulfilled and fulfills God's will, which is the most important thing any of us can do in our lives is to pray for and do God's will. And um, God makes many people righteous because Jesus took their guilt and their punishment. God's harsh punishment of sin inflicted upon Jesus demonstrates 
the depths of God's love for us. There's so many things that we I couldn't talk about. They're really deep ideas that I could read and study and contemplate for hours upon hours in these verses. But I hope this has whetted your appetite to, to read this chapter, chapter 53. Maybe uh, to pr definitely to pray about it, perhaps to consult some commentaries and maybe read some sermons and other things and try to go as deeply as you can into Isaiah 53. I'll let us pray. Dear Father, just thank you for this prophecy that was presented so many years before the life of Jesus. The person in here was not identified by name as Jesus. He was simply identified as a pronoun, he. And yet all the things that we read about in these 12 verses, we see have happened in the life of Jesus, Lord, and now in the life of believers. I ask you to help us look, look past appearances, look past uh, charismatic personalities, Lord. Help us to look deep into people's lives and to see the suffering that they are experiencing, Lord, and the pain that they're in, and to know that Jesus died for them and for everyone, Lord. Everyone can be forgiven. We can be healed. We can be restored to Christ. I mean, we can be restored to you through Jesus Christ, and I just pray that you will help each of us to share that message with others and share our love with others and to open the hearts and minds of people so that people who hear, who've heard, will believe, Lord, and that people who see will believe. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.